Welcome to the Kaleidoscope Podcast. It's your host, George Salas. Today, I give you the third installment of my new segment, Invisible Book Buddies. This time, I brought my friend Henry Gelinas on the show to talk about Donald Newlove's Sweet Adversity. First published in the 70s, it was reprinted by Tough Poets Press in 2019. My guest Henry is a stand-up comic, filmmaker, and writer from North Carolina. His work focuses on how storytelling structures can help to interrelate emotions. You can catch his stand-up in Charlotte, Winston-Salem, and New York. He's currently working on a new short film, so stay tuned for that sometime in 2024. And now, slap on that nicotine patch. Raise your Shirley Temple and enjoy our conversation. Hey, Henry, how's it going? It's going good. Thanks going for good. stopping by and making history with the first ever in-person Kaleidoscope podcast episode. Yeah, I feel like I am a part of history. The Berlin Wall is falling near us. I can, <laughs> it feels monumental. Absolutely. Uh, to get started, I was interested in your journey into stand-up comedy. What can you tell me about that? Yeah, so I've done stand-up for about five years. Um, and I was always sort of, you know, it was something that I was nervous to try, but I had always been kind of the class clown type, mm. but there's always the person around the office or like the teacher who's like, oh, I should have done stand up. And everybody kind of thinks like, oh, they're funny. Uh, but I had been told like, Hey, you got to get up there and try it. And I had done some theater and some different things. And then what it really was is that I had always enjoyed being on stage, but I didn't always love memorizing other people's lines. <laughs> like, you know, I, I would, I could get something out of it, but I was like, huh, it'd be cool if I could kind of bring my own stuff up there. And then, you know, eventually I had to put my money where my mouth is. And there was a uh, church open mic <laughs> that was, I was invited to. And it was a friend of mine who was actually a, I think, oh gosh, was it a violinist or my banjo friend? But a friend of mine that plays music was like, hey, you got to come down to this open mic. Not mentioning it was a church open mic. I get there and I did my material and it went well, which does not happen uh, generally. <laughs> that sounds like a comic origin story in and of itself at a church. Did you have to sort of pull yourself in and, and PG-13 your material at all or no? A little bit, yeah. It was definitely slightly neutered, but I was so green and nervous that I was glad for anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would have done a knock-knock joke. I wanted to do what's funny is I did all of my own material, of course, uh, but the guy that went right before me was an older gentleman, and he was a what he called a cover comic. Mm -hmm. So this was a guy probably mid 50s he goes up before me and he goes i'm gonna do some of my own material and then some of my favorites carlin williams Pryor, and so he just proceeds to do all the comedy greats oh. you know right before i get up and he crushes uh and it's sort of a you know i'm sure he didn't know this it's kind of a cardinal sin to use anyone else's material and then of course i go up the 14 15 year old and i'm like yeah i squeaked these out earlier this morning but <laughs> hopefully it competes against carlin and, yeah well, You've got balls because I was a class clown and had also been told, oh, you should do stand-up comedy. But correct me if I'm wrong, I think the biggest difference is spontaneity versus the expectation of having to make someone laugh. Yeah, yeah, I would say so. I think the, the big challenge, and I did eventually curtail into improvising, which really helped me to stay loose on stage. The big thing is... And I only really felt this the first time doing it. What you don't see sitting watching someone do it is when you go out on stage and you're confronted with the silence and you realize that your job is to manufacture the tension and release of the jokes. It's pretty daunting because you're like, oh, if anything happens, it will be 
either from me or it will not occur at all. Like, you know, you, you think it might, you know, you might discover something in the moment because the really good comics make it look so fluid. It really, nothing happens by accident up there. Either you've, you know, brought something intentionally or it doesn't really work. And But yeah, you're totally right. I think the class clown thing's so great because you might think of a joke based on what the teacher says and you can like whoosh, throw it out and then everybody goes, man, George, <laughs> Henry, you guys, you guys rock. Um, and I think the key is it's actually interesting, the the, the pipeline of, um, you know, the class clown to the stand-up because it's really about creating your own spontaneity. And the way I've always thought about it is the setup is the teacher talking and the punchline is my little wise ass crack on what they've said. But I just presented as one person, but I really split it up into, okay, someone said something and I'm kind of having a reactionary uh, uh, view on it and I do the punchline, but I just presented as all my ideas. Well, how would you compare and contrast with humor writing versus humor standing as it were? Yeah, I mean, you know, in a lot of the ways they can be similar and. I think a lot of it is brevity with stand up. While there are some more experimental comics who don't always go by this, it's usually good to be, uh, say things in less words, kind of cut down. And that's just a general adage. It's not always true. Uh, if you're more of a storytelling comic like prior, you can take as much time as you want as long as you hold the audience's attention. With humor writing, you know, some of the richest stuff is kind of found out through it because you have more time to think you have more time to kind of parse out your ideas uh comedically and so you know like i think about like uh even though this isn't like a literary thing you go back and read some of the old like lampoon articles harvard lampoon stuff and even like their yearbook that they did and it's so rich because they have so much time to develop these comedic ideas and there's punchlines the whole way through but it the landscape allows them to be more patient. Whereas in stand up, you know, they go, Hey, five minutes in the light. And if you don't, you know, get off stage when we give you the light, you can never perform here again. So you're like, Oh shit, I might, you know, cut the word count down a little bit. Um, so yeah, it's really the time that it allows you, I think. And another huge difference that comes to mind is with humor writing. Like you said, you can experiment and maybe test it out on readers. Whereas, as a stand-up comedian, yeah. you're sort of testing it out in the moment on the stage and fine-tuning it with each show. Yeah, I would say that's very true. And and what's funny is also you can try out your material on as many people as you want until you hit the stage. You just don't know. Because mm -hmm. there's been things that just crush when I'm like hanging out with my friends. And they're like, man, you're really going to make it, aren't you, man? And then I get up in the clubs and I'm like, wow, I was never meant to do this. Like you, you try out the same joke and it just gets echoes. Um, but yeah, and I would also say the the linguistic element uh, is interesting with written humor. If you're kind of a fan of bending language, there's a lot of richness in the kind of Joycean approach of of kind of playing with, you know, structures and grammar and all that kind of stuff that isn't going to translate as well with just the oral tradition of of kind of standing up and doing it. So if that's an element of humor writing that you kind of get something out of, that's an element that you, doesn't translate as well mm. uh, to the stage I found. Well, you told me your gateway book into literature was one of the great comic novels that I have yet to read, mm. Confederacy of Dunces by John Kennedy Tool. There you go. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> tell me about this comic novel and what made it so funny. Yeah. I mean, I can say, firstly, it was, well, my introduction to it, I was, my grandparents and I, a big part of my family is uh, New Orleans. There's a lot of family on uh, in New Orleans. And I was staying in New Orleans one summer and I saw this book on the shelf. And my family has a good sense of humor, but on, on that side of my family, they can be a little stiff. So I was like, oh, shit, they've got like a comic novel. That's kind of interesting because it was branded as a comic novel on the front to sell it. And I was like, oh, that's cool. Didn't pick it up, just, you know, shuffle it away. And then I was going, I was at Barnes & Noble and I saw a Confederacy of Dunces. And I went, okay, I'll try this out. And it totally blew things open for me for a bunch of different reasons. If you haven't read it, it's essentially um, this guy named Ignatius Riley, and, and he's sort of his journey through New Orleans and, and uh, his squabbles with his mother, who was kind of the thorn in his side. And I had been interested in, in 
books before, uh, but what was really interesting was how erudite it was, I found, while being really funny. I mean, he's sort of a failed academic. Uh, and he's sort of this, uh, you know, just, yeah, this bedroom academic. He's got all these papers and treatises that don't see the light of day. Uh, but he is, uh, you know, which lots of us can relate to. I, uh, mm. certainly I can. In this circle, yes. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, and, but it was just interesting because there was slapstick, which I was a huge fan of as a kid. That was huge for me. The Three Stooges, Tom and Jerry was like very funny on like a guttural level. Uh, and so there's a lot of slapstick humor in that book, but there was also a lot of heady humor, uh, that you could kind of dig into sort of his failings as an academic and, and, and seeing him flail to try to be this, you know, great figure and falling short. So I think it was the blend of kind of the high and low comedy in one. Uh, and it delivered on that advertisement of comedy novel comedy novel and uh yeah i think so and and then of course you dig into his real life story and it becomes even more fascinating because mm. it has a lot of parallels to the book maybe one day we can read that in tandem but the reason i'm emphasizing the advertisement is did sweet adversity deliver as a comic novel to you i will say not in the way that i expected but yes I will say that if you're looking for something that purports to be a comic novel, you wouldn't be mad at this one. It definitely, uh, I would say, yeah, I would say so. But how, what did you think? Did I think that like Infinite Jest, which was praised so highly for being a funny book, it, it was praised at the expense of its reality, which is it's a lot sadder, somber, and more profound than any of the uh, marketing lingo led me to believe, not to mention the premise itself. So the premise of the book is that we are dealing with a set of Siamese twins who play jazz and uh, drink to their heart's content. And that itself just seems like a wild premise that would have to be hyperbolic, if not cartoonish. Yeah. And for me, and you seem to agree with me, that didn't deliver it Partly for the better, I think, because instead of treating it like a cartoon, this is a more serious work of literature. Yeah. Uh, it's something that I think can stand the test of time, even though it is an invisible book. But uh, tell me more about that, if you agree or disagree. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And and the point about Infinite Jest is definitely true as well. I think... Um, for these sorts of works where maybe a, a publishing house doesn't know exactly where to put it and, and how to market it, I think they might tend to go with that comic novel designation as kind of like the eye candy. Mm. Pick this up, comic novel. It is uh, very well realized, very realistic, like you're saying. I think it could have really devolved into a sort of Laurel and Hardy movie, which is interesting because that uh, Laurel and Hardy are uh, an aspect of this book. But... It's very well realized. I would say, like you're saying, a, a lot more profound than the designation of comic novel would make you assume. Mm -hmm. uh, and while there are plenty of comic moments, I thought that largely its biggest accomplishment was was how realistic it was and how much um, earnestness the story was told for yes. fear that it could have turned into something that was very kind of, you know, laughable. He cares. Donald Nulo as a writer cares about his twins. And instead of just using them as a kind of circus animal for his entertainment or our entertainment, having said that, I did wish there was more comic scenes and elements in this book, especially since it's 600 pages of tiny font. Yes. At that length, though, uh, I would... The Laurel and Hardy esqueness would just kind of peter out, but I did want more of a balance between the somber and the humor. Yeah, no, I totally agree there. Just in the sense that there is so much value and depth in in it, but it is not often broken up by the humor. There are passages. There's a. Uh, stretch where they are driving an ambulance in their hometown and there's definitely some sort of like uh the brakes aren't really working how fast are we going kind of thing where it, where it allows itself to maybe like loosen the collar and be a little bit more playful but 
there wasn't anything I would also say there wasn't anything overtly comic also like scenes that were just strictly comic. I think it always had an underpinning of drama or seriousness. Yeah. Um even in uh sections where like one of the funniest sections um that I think we'll be hearing some from later involves uh someone with dementia uh and and even when uh he is uh espousing things and saying things that are largely funny, it's still contextualized with uh, the fact that he is ailing and losing his memory. And so even when you're laughing, you're still aware of, you know, where he is at that moment. And so it's not necessarily just the punchlines. Mm -hmm. it's, it's funny you mentioned that being the funniest section, because for me, it's the absolute most lugubrious, mm -hmm. morose yeah. section and you, I, I do remember being uh, tickled a little bit at some of the antics, for lack of a better word, in that section. But overall, I just remember being completely depressed and existentially in the depths. Um, the other side of that spectrum, in general, is a writer like Mark Lehner, who is all satire, all jokes, all hyperbole. And I've only read uh, Et Tu, Babe. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that's an example of a comic writer. Whereas in Sweet Adversity, I would, I would mostly call the scenes amusing rather than outright comic. So this is an amusing, yeah. sincere 600-pager. And the first half, I would categorize as a kind of nostalgic Bildung's Roman in the vein of Thomas Wolfe, or my most recent discovery in love, uh, Dow Mossman and his The Stones of Summer. Uh, and then the second half is, prob is darker. It does away with the nostalgia and just completely shows the ugly face of addiction and hitting rock bottom and the bottom of the rock under that rock bottom. <laughs> yeah, all the way to the core of the earth and then down through the core of the earth. Yeah, and back again. <laughs> yes, yes, it, it truly, they've broken through the bedrock with the darkness. <laughs> but there's a kind of Siamese film out there that is connected unofficially to Sweet Adversity, and that is the Farley Brothers' Stuck on You, which I assigned you as homework to watch. Mm -hmm. What did you think of the film? Well, you know, it was interesting because I don't know exactly what my expectations were. I, I guess going in, I was going, okay, how how loosely based is the adaptation here? And then as I kind of settled into watching it, I was like, okay, it's, it's pretty loose, um, uh, at least in, in my viewing of it. Uh, you know, where this... I would say that the movie is largely comic and there really is not a ton of um there is not a ton of the darkness and sort of well-realized strife that the characters feel in the novel it sort of strips that away uh in service of what are some pretty good jokes I mean at at times it works as sort of like a I mean if you know the Farley brothers you sort of know what to expect if you if you enjoy dumb and dumber and that kind of thing which has its place uh mm -hmm. for somebody I like it. I'll rewatch it, you know, once every decade. Um, it it just sort of does away with that and, and goes the more overtly comic direction and then also gets rid of most of the plot of the book, you know, which is okay too. But it does still work well with the uh, – it, it gives them some interesting choices to make since they're still connected in the movie. I should emphasize this is not an adaption. When I – discovered Sweet Adversity through the reprint of Tough Poets Press, I immediately thought of, well, this sounds like Stuck on You. And then I double-checked and I did a little bit of Dr. Googling mm -hmm. to confirm or deny. I couldn't find any official connection whatsoever. But I would be surprised if the Farley brothers didn't read this novel at some point, even though it's on the buried side of the spectrum. So, yeah, it's just strange how there's so many connections. But I do agree with you that they stripped away almost all of the earnestness and sincerity for the sake of what they're known for, the raunchy, dumb humor that, yes. you know, is entertaining, but not necessarily substantive. Uh, but there is a nugget of 
sincerity in that film, just like with another one of my favorites, me, myself, and Irene. I think that's the Farley brothers as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorites. Yeah. And, but I totally agree. You know, it's funny. They do... I appreciated that it's still like Matt Damon uh, and Greg Kinnear uh, play the twins, and they are not hamming it up largely. I mean, there are scenes where they're asked to, but they are still very much trying. They're not phoning it in. There is a scene in a bar in which they have to kill Bill style fight off about 10 guys. Mm -hmm. I don't and, even remember that. <laughs> yeah. And they have a spectacular uh, penchant for suddenly becoming black belts. And you go, oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly how that would go. But, um, you know, like you said, there is still a kernel of earnestness. But, you know, again, you know, f fun to throw on and, you know, fall asleep too if you're having trouble sleeping. But there was a, a, a subplot almost of alcoholism in that. Or no? Uh, I mean, you know, there is a moment in which near the third act where uh, the show that they have found success on opposite of Cher uh, is not doing well because they were keeping it a secret that they were conjoined. Uh, and then, you know, the the press finds out that it's actually conjoined twins in the show and, and everything goes haywire. And briefly... Uh, Greg Kinnear's character starts to self-loathe and he's sort of, you know, only, you know, patching the wounds with alcohol. And you see something that is done very well in the book where there's one character who's trying to kind of, you know, fight through it and not uh, turn down that road as the other one sort of allows the, goes the solipsistic route and, you know, begins to really uh, drink a lot. But it's maybe two or three scenes. Mm. Um but the the no, another parallel is both Siamese twins, the one of the book, the one of the film. They have creative aspirations in the film. Um, not Matt Damon, who's the other actor. Yeah. Oh, Greg Kinnear. He wants to be an actor, correct? Yeah. And our twins in Donald Newlove, they have aspirations to not only play jazz, but to write operas and librettos yes. and... Uh, things of that nature, but whereas they were able to fulfill their dreams, a nice happy ending in uh, Stuck on You, it's not quite what happens in Sweet Adversity. Yeah, no, I mean, and, and I actually really liked having in the book, as opposed to the film, having them have a similar aspiration is very interesting because it allows you to keep a pulse on, you know, how healthy they are how clear-eyed they are about their goals and their intentions. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's very interesting to see them kind of rise and fall. You talked about the element of sort of the uh, remembrance of the past in the first novel uh, and then kind of the stark cold reality of the present in the, in the second one since they're split into two. And it's fun to see how they create these justifications you know as they begin to sort of slip or as one slips and the other one stays healthy you know they're drinking now because it helps their creativity or ostensibly uh, yeah ostensibly they, in in their mind you know of course they, they've created these you know people go hey i thought you were working on the libretto what's going on oh i was writing that libretto when i was sober but now i'm drinking like an artist drinks so now i'm on the right pathway and you sort of see them uh what was sort of you see them kind of be these playful like uh, town charmers in the beginning. They're sort of gleefully courting girls and, and they're like putting on routines where they're Jekyll and Hyde in the beginning of the book. Um, Would you consider that the rise, because you mentioned a rise and fall, but I wasn't quite aware of any particular rise, maybe a rising that is uh, curtailed. Yeah, you know, I would say that Another thing I appreciated about it is it's not very schematic, uh, a book. You know, you wouldn't necessarily look at it and, and go, oh, we have some kind of hero's journey or anything like that. You just, it's very situational throughout. Uh, more than anything, their life is never really ostensibly happy. Uh, whether or not they are in their own vacuum happy within their life uh, is another thing. They sort of go... Uh, their mother is in a series of abusive relationships. The way they cope with that changes. And you see, you know, they find their escapes. You know, they'll go, they're enamored with movies as, as that becomes more popular. And, uh, you know, they're very familiar with culture. They read a lot. Um, 
they're constantly making references to different literary works but the entire time they're you know what they're surrounded by is rather dark and then they begin to uh not be able to put that wall up so much and it begins to maybe creep in a little bit more so i wouldn't say necessarily a rising but maybe like a gleeful ignorance uh for a little bit you know they in spite of their upbringing but there's there's a light and a dark to their upbringing their mother was raped by the father the father is barely in the picture and we have a revolving door of abusive uh, physically, verbally, alcoholic, abusive husbands or f not even father figures who come and go throughout the house. Despite that, they're able to lose themselves in the cinema, as you mentioned, and make friends with various people in the town. And that leads me to what I was going to say, which is you almost, at least for me, forget that they are Siamese twins at times. And they don't even get picked on really at all. They're almost fully accepted and integrated into their town, which to me struck me as a flaw in some sense. Mm. Uh, because even though he's, we know that mentioned that new love is sincere with the way he treats, treats his twins, I do think it's a bit unrealistic that the way they were never picked on and didn't, it wasn't really a hindrance to them. Uh, what did you think about that? Yeah, well, I thought that was interesting. It's also a through line in the film. It's not an ostensible issue for them as far as how they're treated, like you said. You know, they are sort of these charming types, and there is a certain level of novelty, maybe. there is. A, I mean, it's definitely acknowledged. I mean, but to your point, they're never, like, bullied. They're never uh, struck down or really even embarrassed very much. I mean, you would think that there would be a couple moments where they're teed up to be put in a precarious situation or feel, you know, at least blush a little bit and have to, you know, uh, fit in where they don't fit in, but mm -hmm. they are constantly met with, if not full acceptance, at least kind of a, uh, positive curiosity. Um, you know, that might be the most strife that they get from, um, you know, being Siamese mm -hmm. that I could tell. Well, one big difference uh, in that respect with the film is that we don't get the childhood story of the Siamese twins, the celluloid Siamese mm -hmm. twins. Uh, but I also agree, I was going to say the same thing, that if anything, uh, the Siamese-ness is an intrigue and a if anything, an icebreaker, a kind of uh, conversation piece, sure, that, yeah. the fleshy band between them that allows them to uh, get people's attention, to make friends, etc. And yeah, I mean, I do think this stems from the fact that the twins are really Donald Newlove himself. He grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, which is where the vast majority of the book is set. And uh, how else do I put this? Uh, just the, the fact that they are Siamese is more of a metaphor for how he had to deal with his alcoholism. He had, as he described in his memoir, this kind of blood-connected, blood-born twin inside him, his shadow self. Uh, so and so that's why I think it would it's it seems as if it's one person and it's he's treated or they're treated so sincerely is because he's dealing with himself and that is partly in the book's favor but partly a flaw and that's in the sense of it being sort of unrealistic the way they go about themselves. Yeah, I totally agree. Another interesting thing that New Love does as far as the language in approaching them is that you often see them referred to as Leo Dash Teddy. Uh, and they sort of even become to other people, you know, one being. But as you read it, it will be presented as, you know, Leo Teddy, one, singular. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's like, it's very interesting to read. Uh, and it just makes for some very, uh, you know, really interesting sentences. But it's interesting to see how he begins to, not exclusively, but more and more, it is Leo Teddy not Leo and Teddy or Leo or Teddy. It's they are, you know, moving as one uh, entity mm -hmm. through the world, um, even on the page in the sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you mentioned the prose, and that is one of the greatest highlights of this book. He does away with 
prepositions and things of that nature for a kind of telegraphic prose that at first was a bit jittery to get into, but once you get into it, it kind of just flies by, and he really peppers it with these um, Siamese words, these portmanteaus uh, that reflect the state of the protagonists. And they uh, could be traced back to Joycean um, words, especially in Ulysses, where, you know, the uh, the world hung with humid night blue fruit. The mm. night blue there is one example, but yeah, there's a lot of examples of the Joycean. Yeah, and and even just what made such a pleasurable reading experience for me was even in just what could be a very mundane task for another writer in describing the weather or describing light was another thing that I thought was very richly, you know, imagined on the page. You know, it would be uh you know, yellow strewn light through the leaves, or just even these little phrases where it's very evocative in a very short amount of time, uh, a very terse amount of words, but just a really rich picture always developed. But I loved it. I agree with you. It, in the beginning, it felt a little start, start and stop. I wanted a little bit more. I, I, I was trying to get into it and settle into kind of his impressionistic style. But then it made for as much as there are tons of words on these pages. And there are 600 pages, uh, so you you know, but eventually it makes it for a much smoother and faster reading experience, or at least more of a page turner, where it could have you know, I don't think it ever would have been a slog. I I was enjoying it yeah. the whole time. But one of the only reviews uh, that I came across was Brad Bigelow, if I'm remembering his name correctly. Of neglected books, he wrote a nice review of it, although I was surprised to hear how he emphasized the prose being super purple and hard to digest for most readers. And I know it's all relative, but even keeping relativity in mind, I mean, the prose is not really that difficult. No, I totally agree. I mean, you know, I wouldn't want to run into it on a final exam. I'd be like, oh, hell, give me like Hemingway, give me, you know, something that's a little bit more like uh, he walked into the bar. Yeah. He ordered, he lived, you know, just you know, something a little bit more like that. But as far as it being purple prose, I, I would say it's pretty accessible. Yeah. And it's, yeah, it's mostly expository and uh, descriptive, not necessarily abstract or highfalutin in any way that I can perceive. Yeah. No, I totally agree. It, it, if I'm thinking of a novel in which it's trying to do a similar thing as far as like reminiscent, a, a Thomas Wolf kind of model. Maybe something, um, oh gosh, I recall you don't like this one very much. Uh, the Forgotten Soul, The Lost Soul, Brodsky, not, not Brodsky, Brodsky, Harold Brodsky, who am I thinking? The Runaway Soul, the Runaway Soul. Harold Brodsky. Brodsky, yeah. yeah. James McCourt would slit my throat <laughs> on that one. But. but yeah, that felt to me a novel in which it is largely abstraction. Uh, or not largely abstraction, but there's, you know, a pretty heavy dose of that. And it's not always rooted in, you know, a scene and a lot more purple and maybe harder to follow on a scene to scene level. This one is very much expository and, and mm -hmm. pretty much stays within the realm of the realistic in the near the back end. There is some hallucinatory prose that is a little bit more, uh, elastic uh but it's all but it's never presented in a way that's too hard to keep track of and by the time you get there after some 400 500 pages or so you're well with uh, adapted to the waters of it anyway uh, but speaking of the prose i did notice because we talked about how the siamese twins are seen as completely normal and not necessarily monstrous as a bully might pick up on or focus on the prose does describe them as a shadowed crab when they're trying to climb up the garage and get back into their room after having snuck out to see a movie at the cinema and then you know one of the movies that they saw was the double feature of frankenstein and frankenstein's bride and it suggests a parallel between the Frankenstein's monster in them, and then also the running thread of referring to them as Jekyll 
and hide. Uh, but again, I don't think that's coming as a way of of uh, denigrating them, their physical form. I think the Jekyll and Hyde in particular is yet another layer, another metaphor for the alcoholism that they're suffering from and that New Love suffered from. Yeah, I mean, and there, there's a particular uh, passage that I did find quite funny. They begin to have to navigate romantic relationships, sex, that kind of thing, and approaching it and starting to delegate. They're experiencing some frustration, some sort of existential fear of like, can we get married? How are we going to, how can we ever fall in love if I'm, you know, always bound to you? And there's this scene in which I can't remember how they are there, but they are, they're hanging out with these two girls. They might be in their teens at this point, maybe 15 or 16. And it's very clear that their aspirations for the night is to maybe, you know, take it the romantic uh, bachelor suite uh, direction. And uh, you talk about, um, you know, the the Frankenstein uh, stuff and, and Karloff being the actor who famously played Frankenstein a couple times. And there is uh, the end of a paragraph. They're sitting on this couch pining after these two girls and wanting very deeply for them. And it just says, the Karloff monster was horny. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, you know, sort of, and and I just thought it was interesting, especially there to, uh, you know, present them as this sort of uh, singular figure that can't be uh, split into multiple, but desires that very heavily. I did come across uh, some little breadcrumbs like that. This kind of staccato phrase that comes out and is humorous or amusing, uh, such as this random description of one of their friends who, quote, uh, sat like Hitler about to bite a cyanide caps on. Like, where did this come yeah. from? Uh, but to go back to what you were saying, I would also add that the relationships almost come too easily as far as the hurdles you would imagine them having being banned together. Yeah. Uh, but they come across people who are all too willing to have sex with both of them. Right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> at either one at a time or at the same time even. Yeah. And it's interesting, you know, when they do have, I thought it was such an interesting choice. And this is where I felt it flagged more than anything. When they did start to experience strife, whether it be platonic or romantic with people in their lives, the the issue would always be coming from an external source that really didn't have to do with them actually being bound to one another. It might be an emotional issue that they're not handling very well because of their resentment towards the self. But there's a there's a passage in which finally, um, you know, one of them has been married and is now had some children. And throughout the entire novel, they they each alternate days. You know, it'll be the other one's day to decide where they go. Hey, I want to go get a milkshake. That's where they go. So they sort of delegated it that way. And now that one of them has become married, this great problem they've been worried about solving, uh, you know, in their youth, they switch off every three days. Okay, we'll go to my wife's house and see my children. And then we'll go uh, see the mistress is the uh, is the other person. So one of them is married and the other one has this mistress who's on the run from uh, from her husband. And I just thought it was so interesting that when they finally have to face this problem, the issue that belies them is not anything with balancing time management or that. It was that the person that uh, Teddy is seeing is in fact a mistress. And I just thought it was so interesting that it was a problem external to the intrapersonal. Mm -hmm. uh, so another moment where New Love decides to you know, treat them as just completely normal, which, you know, again, it does pay dividends in that they are very well realized and, and you're never rolling your eyes at the page. But there are, I think, lost opportunities to accentuate mm -hmm. the the sort of dramatic pull of, okay, how are we going to deal with this? It doesn't really ever give them trouble, even when the situation is finally actualized of the marriage. Three days with one woman, three days with another, so to speak. Uh that's not something you have to be Siamese to do, and it's all it's too much of a cliche in in general. Uh, the daddy who goes gets cigarettes, never comes back, or <laughs> right, <laughs> living yeah. a double life of some sort, having another family in some other area of the same town or another town, etc. Uh, but yes, 
there's also lo- lots of lost opportunities for the humor, uh, the physical humor of being Siamese. And one thing I mentioned in my review is I would have fully welcomed uh, explosive diarrhea from one twin, sure. the other one being held hostage in the bathroom, maybe trying to frantically light matches or something. I don't think that would have taken away from the earnestness of the novel considering its vast scope and it would balance out more. I, yeah, I totally agree. And also what's funny is uh, for all of the defects that the Farley brothers may have as directors, one thing they are very willing to do is have one person have diarrhea mm-hmm. as the other is held hostage. That is one of their tropes, if not their crowning achievement. And mm-hmm. most of their cinema is, hey, I've got the runs and we're sharing an apartment. That's one thing they like to return to quite often. So uh, I agree. But also like, yeah, I think um, as they are so, the twins are so self-aware and sort of uh, charming about their predicament that they never really, you know, they, it never goes in that direction. And I totally agree. There's so much earnestness and, you know, darkness that I don't think some, some moments like that would have been a detractor at all. They did have hints towards certain things. I don't know if you remember out of the blue, one of their friends or someone they're trying to work with to get into possibly filmmaking or acting even. He says, Do you guys have you guys blown each other? And then it's and then not New Live writes them saying no, shiveringly lying. Lying. Yes. And then the delivery I think was funny, but Again, it's just in passing, and a lot of this book is seems to be in passing. The structure, if we want to talk about that now, I think is one of its biggest flaws. It jumps in time illogically. Uh, some of the more serious scenes are just glossed over. You learn about them. You're like, where did after you learn to love these characters, especially in the beginning, his sister Millie and the mother Stella. You learn to love these or appreciate at least these characters, and then they just disappear about a couple hundred or so pages in, and you're wondering what happens, and then you only get bits and pieces, just like a little telegram. Yeah. Uh, that, And then you're like, well, why didn't I even get a scene of that? At some point, we learned that, you know, uh, one of the twins is married, has a kid, Stuart, uh, and then we don't even get much of that. And it just, I love the first half. And I should mention that these two novels were originally published separately in the 70s. And then they were republished in the late 70s, I believe, 1978, by Avon Bard in a mass market paperback. And New Love considers that to be the definitive edition. He disowned the separate Siamese twins and only has love for the one bound by a physical spine and he also edited the prose a bit to quote unquote clean it up or whatever make it less quote unquote purple Mm -hmm. uh but yeah he even admits in his memoir that uh for all what talent he may have or what talent he may not have uh that he was never quite good at structure and wanted to rely on dialogue to move what plot there may be forward and this was during his drunk spear years as he calls them (laughs) when he thought you have to be an alcoholic like Hemingway or Fitzgerald to write a great book and all those books that he wrote at that time in his life remain unpublished although tough poets who reprinted this book that we just read tells me he's going to publish a kind of omnibus of the drunk spear novel so we'll see how good or bad they may be. Mm. Uh, But having said that, even though in his memoir he's referring to his drunken days, I believe, I think that problem carries over into this, which is his uh, second and third sober novel, his first being The Painter Gabriel, the debut novel. Uh, But I haven't read that one or some of his others to gauge if... It's a recurring problem, the structure or not. But for this, 
it made me feel as if we're dealing with a great American novel that is stuck in its marble and is like a Michelangelo prisoner, not finished mm. in that sense. What did you think of the structure and everything? You know, I totally agree. I think it's a question of should he have focused on other scenes and kept it the same length or should he have pattered it out a bit more and had it be a little bit longer because you do run into this thing where it's almost like in a film the stuff that is sometimes the most important that you're invested in is spoken to off screen it's alluded to uh because it'll jump you know there will be these very small little paragraph breaks and you might be three years ahead uh from the previous scene that you were um reading and to a certain extent it's fun to try and play catch up and and resituate yourself but it does start to you you it really does start to get i my feeling was in the beginning the first novel it, he really gives a lot more time scene to scene and you're not rushing ahead very far and you sort of see a complete you know uh tableau of their childhood and then you know if you were to compare the amount of time that passes in the second piece it's just becomes exponential i mean we cover you know i mean over the entire novel by the end of it they're you know either 40 or in their early 40s but most of the time that transpires is in the second novel you see them you know you do see them from you know birth to early teen time in, in the first work or maybe they get up to their 20s and then it just begins to sort of rapidly jump uh as they try to make their ascension as writers, composers, and all that kind of thing on their uh, way to New York is their big aspiration. You could almost write it off as being a kind of structural device that reflects them being alcoholic and blacking out all the time. If that had been only in the second half, but mm. what you described as, you know, being set in the scene and taking its time, I've found that to be only true for at best the first half of the first half mm. and but it does go off the rails with the jumping and the skimming uh in the the half of the the second half of the first half uh, and i would almost be willing to humor <laughs> a new love no pun intended if what he focused on was as important or as interesting or as funny or as sad as the things that he glosses over but the second half is so bloated with unnecessary dialogue with faceless tertiary characters who can just be swapped out between each other and have no bearing whatsoever on the twins lives uh, and so that's why having finished the book and i kind of not only was I disappointed, but the disappointment kind of compacted with the more the more time I had to process and think about the novel. Yeah. You know, I would say, especially the point you make about characters being interchangeable in the second half, that's where I became most disappointed because most of the people that stuck with me, you know, the mother, the daughter, uh, the, the most, the one that has the most, um, uh, the father figure or lack of that has the most time with the mother is someone named George Fox who sort of owns this uh, play hall casino kind of thing and these are all very well realized characters they have their own inner lives you spend you know a good time getting to know each of them and then the back half of it you they start to run into Leo and Teddy run into these poets or you know composers and it's these little clusters of artists who uh, are all sort of you know sharing their own ideas and experiences but they're all just mouthpieces for the ideas mm -hmm. you're not really um you're not really granted much time to get to know them. And then it becomes clear where I started to kind of skid and go, oh, shit, this is going to go off the road, was it sort of becomes obvious that New Love is very interested in having the ideas out to sort of debate. I mean, there is a lot of uh, theological debate. There is a lot of philosophical debate. And it seems his interest is in uh, getting to the bottom of those questions, not so much who's asking them or why they care or any of that. It's getting those questions into the stadium to be batted back and forth, but not necessarily what does not matter as much is who's believing these things, who's sharing them, because it starts to be very fast paced. Oh, here's an opera composer who is a theist. Here is a poet who's not. 
uh, in very rapid succession. Uh, yeah. For me, those ideas, the theological and the philosophical, are too shallow to have engaged me. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would never go so far as to say that this is a novel of ideas. And if Nulov wanted to write something like that, then he should have gone all in with his man, the man without qualities or some musical esque thing. Uh, so again, that's just a, another reason why I was so disappointed with, especially the second half. I think the first half, for its flaws, is still. Very good, very good. Yeah, and I and I would say because it's also interesting. He is he never the effort is the same all the way through. He he definitely cares very much about the scenes that he does choose to show us. I don't think he contextualizes them very well. The reason I say this is if you're thinking about reading this book, I still think there are plenty of glimmering highlights in the second half, but they are fewer, farther between. They are given less. Uh, cartilage and tissue and connecting fibers to matter in the narrative. Um, you know, cause there's still plenty in the back half that I love a lot. I mean, you know, his, he doesn't really make a portrait of New York so much like they're in New York and, and that doesn't seem to be particularly important mm -hmm. to the plot I, I found, but yeah, there's still moments that are worth getting to, uh, as they sort of devolve, uh, in the drunks. Yes. In, in my opinion, but it's not, um, as a total work, if you're looking at it holistically, yeah, not not as strong. The these the twins, as in the twins of the two books that were together, finally in the reprint, uh, are just quite different from each other. Not in a good way. Uh, but <laughs> the back matter of the book it mentions how AA meetings are turned into riveting dramas, which unfortunately I can't quite agree with. <laughs> and I was excited. To see the New Yorker say that because uh, the paragon of AA meetings is infinite jest. And I wanted to see how that st uh, stacked up against DFW's depiction of AA meetings. And maybe New Love crawled so that DFW could soar in that sense. Um, there is... I mean, he passes over the meetings, too, in a way. I mean, it's not until the very end that we get a full meeting and we end with a monologue, which I thought was good, but again, not as good as it could have been or should have been. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, especially, and again, this is the same conundrum as the comic novel that is actually not a comic novel, but has, you know, has that sort of crown of thorns to sell more. Like I, when I was, this was purported to me as an AA novel. I was expecting, you know, a lot of it to be in that uh, space, if not some, but I would say it is not even a characteristic of, like you're saying, until the very end. And, and the last scene, which, of course, how you end matters a lot. So New Love obviously found a lot of value in Teddy, who has not ever spoken at an AA meeting as they've battled. They, you know, both characters have gotten sober and fallen off the wagon. There's this sort of, um, you know, I had my 89 days, but I didn't get to 90. Like, you're, you, they have these watermarks that they fail to reach, but he has never spoken at a meeting. And, and that's sort of like, um, you know, the big uh, finale. And that's compounded by the fact that Teddy is the one who is completely categorically opposed to AA, whereas Leo is more open to it, not only more open to it, he signed up to AA in an attempt to get back, uh, was it his wife? Yeah, yeah, he, well, it was, uh, he's now lost his wife, but there's a new, they moved in briefly with this girl in New York, and he's going to propose to her. Mm. And they don't, I mean, they're addled by alcohol, and, and she's like, hell no, I'm not marrying you. And then he goes, well, what if I go to an AA meeting? And she goes, ah, shit, I'll think about it, <laughs> you know, mm. and that's kind of prod Samantha. Yeah, and we learn that, I th what I think it was, I can't remember which woman it was since they're so in the in the background uh, but we learned in passing that she had a miscarriage 
and she wa- she needed to be taken to the hospital and she couldn't uh, because one of the twins was black out drunk. Uh, that is an extremely important scene that should have been a scene and not mm-hmm. something mentioned in passing. And we also learn that another straw, another alcoholic straw that broke the camel's back is a scene. Again, we don't get the scene, but a mention of the twins driving drunk with Stuart, the kid, their kid in the lap and them bursting through the median and going into head-on traffic before um, stopping in, what is it, tomato patch or something? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is mentioned passing. Again, why? Why is, I, why is he choosing not to focus on these scenes? Yeah. I mean, I, I was wondering, I was really curious, you know, what was his compass in that back half, because of course, like you say, he is very personally invested as the twins are sort of a uh, representative of him, and and you know he's working some things out in that way, uh, and obviously he sets their uh, ascent into the world in his own hometown, so he's very invested. Uh, I you know it begins to be a little bit more meandering uh, in that back half, and it is just interesting he almost exclusively the things he glosses over are the you know the 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 big moments and you know again like you're saying and maybe it does heighten a little bit as a structural conceit as they get you know more drunk but from the beginning that that structure is there of kind of hopping around yeah almost um, the beginning but yeah yeah and i think it, it's yeah. consistent for about maybe 150 pages if I want to be completely unkind, I could almost wonder if he f- fell off the wagon <laughs> while he was writing this. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. But no, no. Uh, according to his <laughs> memoir, he was fully sober yeah. the whole time. And Who can we he, trust? Who can yeah. we trust? He died at the ripe age of 93, I think. Hmm sober as far as i know so yeah he battled with his demons and and succeeded and apparently you know even after agents and publishers forgot about him he just continued to write and self-publish a ton of things which you can find on amazon Uh, i do have a signed copy of the heart truant i can't quite remember the title but that would be the next new love i read Mm. uh to get a better feel for his strengths and his weaknesses. I did read uh, The Wolf Who Ate the Sun. I might be getting that title wrong, but more or less, that's the title. Mm. And that was published for the first time. It came out of New Love's Drawer by Mm. Tough Poets Press. And it's supposed to be this weird CIA-esque novel uh, that deals with People who also may be werewolves, mm. <laughs> not not um, Twilight or anything, but uh, yeah. the whole thing is almost in dialogue, and it defeated me. I just lost interest. Mm. Uh, so uh, yeah, there's a thread there of relying heavily on dialogue and not really knowing how to structure a novel. Yeah, I was gonna say it, I would be curious to see how much better I assume he would be in a short form. Because if I were to have just read, you know, Leo and Teddy, which was the name of the first published novel when it was by itself, I would have been, you know, even in that, like you're saying, the back half of the first half, it it becomes a little bit flimsier, but it, you know, I thought it was very well done. Um, and so maybe that's what it is, you know, those sort of short bursts and 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 pictures that don't need to be sustained for so long. Um, And, you know, there's an interesting argument. It would be interesting to see, you know, were the publishers right? Is this better in uh, two halves? Because when you are presented it all the way through, you do, I think it's a little bit more glaring that he runs out of steam. Mm. And you're like, oh, he's cramping. He's starting to walk. He is at the water station. He is no longer sprinting. Whereas if I were to have read them apart, not that it would have made either book better, but it probably would have glossed over and gently, you know, obscured the fact that he loses some of the gumption that I think is present in the first work. What would be even more interesting of an experiment 
would be to read the drunk spear novels and see maybe they're masterpieces. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't want to say for sure, but I'm w- I'm willing to check him out and see, uh, because he does give the descriptions of them and his his aspirations for what he wanted them to be, and they do sound really intriguing. Yeah, almost more intriguing than the premise for Sweet Adversity. So mm. we'll have to check those out once they finally get published. Another great experiment could be, it's like the Rolling Stones had a producer that once said, our music is not fully, it's meant to be experienced on uh, psychedelics. And then Backslash, he said, if you've never done coke and listened to one of our songs, then you haven't heard one of our songs, is what he said. Mm. Uh, and an interesting experiment could be, read one half sober, one half drunk, and then flip it again and see. Well, in his memoir, Donald Lanou Love's memoir titled Those Drinking Days, he is very adamant about alcohol or any illicit substance. I mean, alcohol is, isn't illicit, but any substance for that matter as being antithetical to creative inspiration. And he said his premise is that the people who did write great novels like Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby, he wrote it in spite of alcohol rather than because of alcohol. And then he spends... Uh, maybe about half of the no- of of the memoir, looking at these works by famous alcoholics or not so famous alcoholics who he knew personally, some he didn't know personally, and um, testing out his thesis in mm-hmm. that sense. Although I think he's a bit too uh, narrow about it. I mean, he's coming from a place where he's c- categorically opposed to alcohol uh but i don't know i'm uh, i'm willing to keep a more of an open mind and this is coming from a social drinker who rarely socializes and thereby rarely drinks uh, but aside from alcohol you have huxley's doors of perception mm. that could inspire and people to write something that we may call a great work or not. And then I'm thinking now of the Kubla Khan poem that was written after a, a, a dream that was inspired by opium. Mm. So that's at least one example of drugs um, producing something rather than hindering it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was going to say in response to what you said about him being co- sort of categorically opposed, one thing that in looking at what Infinite Jest does so well in the AA scenes, in part, that I felt that this one, especially near the end, really started to lag, is it becomes very obvious exactly how New Love feels through the text. And he presents, and I wouldn't say that Infinite Jest is necessarily trying to, it is definitely more willing to prod any system of belief and, and is not necessarily, you know, all for AA all the time. This one just had a very sort of the same way that the twins never get bullied. Mm. People might uh, raise issues and and have trouble within the system of Alcoholics Anonymous, but it becomes very clear that that he's sort of, and I'm not mad at someone espousing, you know, if they've made up their mind on something and they go, hey, you're reading my book, this is how I feel. But it didn't make for great, I didn't feel a particular tension, Mm. especially near the end, because all of the meetings especially I'd say the last scene, the monologue is excellent. You sort of see this sort of kumbaya attitude. Everybody's won mm-hmm. uh, or or is very close to winning because they're, they've they almost submitted to the system of of belief and, you know, uh, trying to, and, and, you know, I think largely that that's the risk you run. Any, any given writer is going to have their opinion. New Love clearly uh, is is a fan, but he didn't, I don't think he complicated it nearly enough the same way that Wallace presents uh, presents these meetings. It, it wasn't so schematically positive. Yes. I mean, we do have, as we mentioned, Teddy, who is a skeptic, if not a complete asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so there is that bit of tension, but I do see what you're saying, that there could have been more, and New Love admitted to being a stalwart, if not authoritarian proponent of AA while writing this. Uh, but I don't think he was that throughout his life. Uh, he does and admit 
in the book itself through the mouth of his characters that the AA handbook is some of the driest, worst writing he's ever come across. And uh, in general, AA, for what good it has done, is problematic in the sense that it's, uh, from a religious standpoint, the higher power, which is the tentative title of a work that Nula thought about writing, a sequel uh, to Sweet Adversity called The Higher Power. And now I'm thinking of someone I knew back in the day, knew of back in the day, and I covered his story when I was uh, writing a piece on racism in America. He was an ex-neo-Nazi skinhead, and which was also fueled by drugs. And it was a secular epistemology that saved him and got him clean and um, got d- did away with his prejudice, etc. And he, at that time, started a- an alternative to AA called Saved by Reason, and it's a secular-based program. So that would be my criticism of AA. But yeah, I think we should each read our pieces. You, being a stand-up comedian, should read what you deem to be one of the funniest scenes. So can you give us the context to that? Sure, yes. So this scene, the twins have now made it to New York. It's actually the first time you see them uh, in the first part of the novel. They're talking about New York. It becomes this pilgrimage that they have in mind. They're sure that they're going to go. Um and actually, let me correct myself. When you meet them in the second novel, they have not successfully made it yet. They've they've tried to launch and they failed. Um, but now that they've made it to New York, they have switched their compass from wanting to write librettos and and literary works and operas to wanting to produce films. And so they've gone into this bank uh, where they've uh, tried to get a loan for twenty thousand dollars, and the uh, bank teller person that they're talking to is about to break for lunch. And they go, well, hey, let's uh, let's meet you for lunch. And as she comes in to uh, meet them at the restaurant, a couple of their friends who are poets and artists around the city also sit down at the table and begin to espouse their sort of anarchistic philosophy. And they are all a bit oh, off balance in their presentation. And it's very, I thought it was probably one of the funnier scenes in the book. So a uh, brief break for ads as I go to uh, find my place in the book. An audible presentation. <laughs> yes. Sit down, relax, draw some bath water and get that lavender. And welcome. <laughs> All right. So this is the beginning. Leo and Teddy are sitting in the restaurant already. And their friends come into the uh, restaurant with them unexpectedly. There's going to be some theatrics because uh, one of them has a slight stutter and then Teddy has lost his two front teeth. <laughs> so, I want to hear that stutter. Oh, yeah. Or look, the, the lisp. I, uh, you know, my linguistics coach had a field day when I uh, brought this piece in for acting club. So here we go. Moses and Aaron Katz hurry in dripping. The horn-rimmed cat's twins, slim, husky, bald, and studious. Hello, Leo and Teddy. Join him at table. Good, good, Igor. Teddy gurgles over his glass. Signals the waiter for two more. Asks the cats's, want some gin and garbage? We're wine drinkers, Aaron says. This is our favorite restaurant. We don't plan to change it after the revolution, Moses says. Hooks his cane on his chair. Though bald, Moses' hair hangs over his collar, his eye a mad financier glitter. We turn down your ghetto libretto, he tells Leo Teddy. We feel it's premature, Aaron says, and too serious, Moses says. You really don't understand the spirit of radical pataphysics. You're both too serious, he adds solemnly. Shall we mail it back, Aaron asks, or just burn it? Leo Teddy tingles pain. We'll pick it up, Leo says. Twins drain gin. Teddy puts his arm around Leo, grinning spongily. Me and my brother, we take rejection. Thweet are the utith of adversity. Right? Right? Alice blows in on a gust, still beauty waved. The manager one hands her coat, folds in a scarf, gloves, dry umbrella, and hangs them. Leo Teddy fixes admirably on the manager's deft, grave, one-handed jugglery. Look, Alice says, seated. Call me Alice. I may be middle-aging... Uh, rapiditimo, but I feel a lot younger than Mrs. Anchor. A 
A martini? Mrs. Anchor, the manager asks. Yes, my God, it's judgment day out there, Miguel. I didn't expect it so soon. Well, are you twins musicians too? Poeth, Teddy says. Radicals, Aaron says. We edit the East Village Mother. Is that for housewives? Alice asks. It's not even for marriage, Aaron says. Oh, Alice laughs. What is it for? Poets, Aaron says. We're legislating. Legislating what? Alice asks. The re re revolution, Moses says. We're, we're, we're the vanguard. Well, I'm curious, Alice says. What are you revolting against? The total culture, Aaron says. After us come the anarchists. We're, we're, we're just p p pointing the way. For whom, Alice asks. For what? What revolution? We are the revolution, Aaron says. You two guys sitting here? Alice asks. Yes, Aaron says. It's all going to spring from us. We, we, we can give a complete rundown on it. I wish you would, Alice says. When we were exiled from the old Le Du Mego on 7th Street, Aaron says, we led the underground poets to Le Metro on 2nd Avenue for readings, then to St. Mark's on the Bowery, and finally we dispersed through the West Village. There weren't any poetry readings in the West Village either before we began our readings there. By then we must have had 50 poets. F -f -f 500 you can't call them all poets, Leo says. Yes, they are, Moses says severely. Of course, Aaron says austerely, his face cold and weighty. What else would you call them? Well, some of them can't write. You're too serious, Aaron says. You've got to dig p -p -p pataphysics. What's pataphysics, Alex asks. It's the revolution, Aaron says. It's from Patagonia. And that is the end of that. So why did you choose that in particular? Well, I really enjoyed... Uh, they go on for a little while longer. It, what it sort of does, it's kind of a microcosm of where I think New Love finds a lot of the humor in the book, which is people that are deemed rational or sober or, you know, something else are confronted with artists or people who are more addled by alcohol. And, you know, you see these little, you know, like the, the idea of we're the revolution, sort of the same thing that uh, Leo and Teddy experience, which is these highfalutin expectations of stardom with art or uh, success with their operas. Uh, and so you see these two poets who are just themselves, the revolution, and, and you see this bank teller kind of go, just you two, okay. And it's kind of this moment where she is clearly seeing two guys who have this very big dream of overthrowing systems and all that kind of stuff. And she just goes, oh, okay, so you guys are the, the revolution. It's just you two. And they go, yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of, uh, that distinction. And then, of course, pataphysics from Patagonia. <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> and there is the moment where, was it Teddy or Leo who has the list? Uh, it, it's Teddy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as far it was amusing to see you do the lisp. <laughs> it was it's not amusing to read the lisp for several hundred or so pages yeah. and then he finally fixes his front tooth yes. that he knocked out and then knocks it out again yes. and we get the lisp again. This is not funny. <laughs> yeah. No. It's, it's funny that he I mean, I did learn in his memoir that it was more of a kind of dedication or a Oh, homage. Mm. <laughs> Beautiful word, George. Homage oh, <laughs> to his friend who had done that, knocked out his front tooth by running into a pole or something. Mm. Uh, but yeah. Wow. Well, we want to balance out the what little humor we have in this book uh, against the weighty, I don't even want to say ponderous, but profound lugubriousness uh, with one of my favorite sections, which is when we all of a sudden are treated to uh, the twins acting as nurses to an old guy who has dementia. Na his name is Dale. He was a successful businessman. And I did learn, fun fact, because this is such a different section compared with probably the rest of the, the whole novel, it comes from a longer novella, if not novel, that New Love was writing. And he just kind of took a piece of it and put it in here, put the twins in. Uh, and it's partly my favorite because of just not only how sad it is, but how there is a bit of humor with the forgetfulness that we see and the, the kind of mind going in and out of time, which... Again, it's humorous, but it's also heartbreaking and even horrific. And it, and this guy, Dale, 
is just dwindling so for so long in front of their eyes and even before they became Dale's nurses. And his body is giving up and skin is sloughing off and blisters are cracking his feet and so many infirmities, shall we say, are just destroying him, yet he's still living, oh, like a decade beyond what the doctors gave him and then some. Uh, and it gets to the point where the twins decide to give him death with dignity and put him out of his misery, but they back out at the last second. Uh, so here's the scene. Twins keep Mrs. Summerfield's weighty dictionary in their room, a bulky Shakespeare and her occult tomes. Dale rattles and groans through Friday midnight, twins in the sick room, their blood waiting for the true rattle. Shudder, turn away. Dale groans through his nose. They look back, pinch that nose, take away his pillows, let him drown. They try to read. Dale moans. Look, why doesn't he die? Leah whispers. Sit in the dark. Listen to breathing. You're ready, Mr. Summerfield. Let go, Teddy whispers. Dale breathes. Twins clap each other's knee for courage, rise, pull blankets past shaky, rabbity feet, white body clenching for breath, falling, clenching. Pull out pillows, let head fall, open winter windows, sit down. Dale chokes and sniffs nostrils, bellowing. Get the great dictionary, the Shakespeare, pile books on Dale's chest. He drifts into overflowing resistance. The bed shakes. His sealed mouth rips open, brows clench, closed eyes hang in their sockets. A blood-red bush fills the bedroom and the twins' vision. They leap to the bed, books off, windows down, pillows back, covers up. Dale breathes regularly. Saturday, the twins eat grape ice cream with grape jelly in their room, hit their burgundy closet with steady stealth. Here, Gada Damarung. That night, they fall asleep on the living room couch, drunk. Kenny comes downstairs about 6 a.m. and says, He just died. Twins sit up, still feeling the hand that wakened them. Go upstairs, nerves dry, eyes flushed, fatherless. Dale's bedroom. Dust floats in sunlight. Dale is gray slate. His mouth gapes without teeth. His nose, stone, closed eyes, sunken ridges. Stillness dusts him, torn limbs at one with eternity. So, one of my favorite parts, for sure, and uh, that alone, that section alone, is the worth the price of admission. And I think it does a good job of highlighting how somber and depressing this book can get. And also, we got more of the telegraphic style of the prose, whereas your section was more of the heavy dialogue. Mm. So, that comes to the million dollar question. <laughs> Why is this book invisible, do you think? Mm. It is a great question. And I'm a great staller. No, I have an answer. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's interesting. It, it, of, there were books around this time that uh, are of a similar vein that sold well. I think... It's always hard to figure out if this just wasn't in the popular consciousness, if this wasn't the kind of thing that people, I don't know how well known. I know that when New Love's first book came out, it was got some acclaim and, and he was at least hot on the scene in that kind of New Yorker bubble. He had a positive review in Time magazine. Yeah. At the time, right. that's a pretty big deal, even though now it's just a digital shadow of itself. Right. But, you know, of course, it seemed that it's just interesting to me because it seemed contemporaneous to when he was putting books out. He had some momentum. Um, so I think, you know, in my reading of it, 
it definitely also i would say felt like it didn't you know it does report to be a comic novel and then if you stick with it for the first 50 60 pages you might be politely duped and think okay this is you know uh, you know, humorous in spite of the fact that there's already so much drama and darkness laid out. But I think it is not an easy thing. Like if I was selling this book on someone, I certainly wouldn't say, here's a comic novel for you to read. There's, so I think it, you know, falls victim to that marketing issue of it's maybe a hard thing to encapsulate. And the, and the, an extreme example of that of that is people reading Lolita for the quote unquote pornography. That right. doesn't necessarily exist at all, really. Uh, of course, Lolita wasn't necessarily advertised as a pornographic novel, but the first publisher was known for its erotic content, and it, it, they basically published smut books because he couldn't find mm. a publisher. So I guess already by by dint of that, it's set... Uh, a kind of expectation that wasn't met. And yet, here we are in the future, uh, and Lolita is a masterpiece that can't be denied and is in the canon, yet sweet adversity uh, is in the shadows, in the sewers, forgotten. Brad Bigelow does make a good point in his Neglected Books review that uh, something I didn't know is that these mass market paperbacks are treated as kind of like direct to DVD films. Mm. And so there was no interest from critics to review it. And uh, that is definitely going to be a hindrance, especially if Sweet Adversity is, uh, in as a one piece, the final great grand version or vision of Donald New Love. Uh, but the first half and the second half were published separately in a nice hard cover. Uh, I don't know quite how they were received. I think it got some good reviews, but if people only read, say, one or the other, and I think that would contribute to it eventually just petering out altogether. Yeah, I was going to say it has a bit of the sort of like the auteur's curse like maybe a Ridley Scott who has 16 cuts of Blade Runner or whatever it is it's like hey we don't know which one of these is you know point us in the direction of the one you think is good which one do you want us to watch mm -hmm. and if you don't you know because especially in the the 60s and 70s book tours were still a prevalent thing less so now still still around uh, for something that gets a lot of press but this was a much more prevalent thing you know people would go out to these things and there were authors they were excited about and so you go okay you need this like firework show to go off on the first round like when we announce this book people need to come out to the tour and they need to get excited about it and so it's like when you say that actually psych the two ones that you read were disjointed you were not supposed to read them that way the good news is here's a new one you've got a bit of that lessened excitement. There's not as much momentum. It's like, hey, I know you watched the two and a half hour cut of Blade Runner. The six hour, uh, you know, Satan Tango <laughs> Blade Runner is now out and you need to go see it. There's a little bit of confusion as to, uh, you know, the marketing there. So I think it could be just a thing of like, had he put these together for the first run and said, here's the 600 page opus, that first round through, uh, the expectation maybe would have been a little bit more clear. Whether or not people liked it is another thing, but the expectation of this is how this is supposed to be received and digested would be more clear. And the next question would be, does it deserve more readers, despite its the flaws that we more or less agree on, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think so. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't want to, kick a book that's already out of the canon if there's some other things that you are be honest oh no of course no yeah I, uh yeah i yeah no allegiance no allegiance i'm uh i'm not bought i'm not bought <laughs> george did give me uh you know an antioxidant drink before the podcast <laughs> uh but i'm still gonna tell the truth um yeah you know i think there's so many things that are canonically important there's so much to read Honestly, get to those first is my feeling, but this does deserve to be read. There are glimmers of greatness. There are spots that I thought were really well realized and some ideas, uh, even in the back half of the book that I went, okay, this is not 
singular. It's got some precursors, but what he's doing is unique and not uh, trodden ground. Uh, so I would say it definitely deserves more readers. If you've got some really important things that you've glossed over that you should, you know, run back and read, I would get to those first, but I would not neglect this. And I would also say that it's worth giving it a try, especially if you're still interested in it after we've given you what I would hope is a more accurate impression, uh, as opposed to the impression of it being a Farley Brothers, a Ringling Brothers type of book. <laughs> yeah. Um, so on the back um, of the Tough Poets reprint, we get a, a blurb from the neglected book page, which says it's easily one of the most ambitious American novels of the last 50 years. I would agree with that. Maybe difficultly one of the most ambitious American novels of the last 50 years. That I would give to... Dow Mossman's The Stones of Summer, which even when he when Dow is struggling with the what he called the three layers of chaos in the last of the three parts in that novel, it still reads cogently and just much better, much more important and, and profound than unfortunately sweet adversity. But again, you could do a lot worse as far as recommending books and the pros. Uh, pretty is, is pretty consistent throughout. I, I never found myself balking at a cliche here or there. It's uh, that alone is an impressive achievement. So the, he's got the pros down. He's yeah. There's other qualities as we mentioned. So yeah, no. And I would say as far as stuck on you, the film, not since Citizen Kane. Have we seen a vision so clear, so disruptive? Uh, and if you watch it, buckle your seatbelt because you will probably never be the same. As Scorsese said, this is cinema. <laughs> yeah. And this is literature. Yeah, that's right. That it is. Okay, Henry, it's been a true pleasure. Thanks for coming on the show and bringing your physical, corporeal body here. Uh, yeah. yeah. See you next time. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Thank you for having me. And till next time. So there you have it. I hope you had as much fun listening as we had recording. Remember to catch Henry cracking jokes and taking names in Charlotte and the Big Apple. He told me that he's currently building a website and hopes that the domain address henryandjelinas.com isn't taken. I was fortunate enough to interview Donald Newlove before his death, and you can read that exchange for free on the site, thekaleidoscope.com. I also have a text review of Sweet Adversity and his memoir, Those Drinking Days, scheduled to appear near the end of December. If you believe in the work I do and want early access to content like this, among other benefits, consider supporting my efforts through our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the kaleidoscope. You can also show support by purchasing New Love's books through the affiliate links in the description. Together, we can fight against the apocalypse of wordlessness. Thank you, and be sure to tune in again next time. <laughs>